Hello, hi everyone, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of today, 25th of November 2021. Uh, today, I have the pleasure and honor to co-host you together with my colleague and friend Kamal Singh from Heliot Watt University. Um, we have the pleasure and honor of hosting our friend and colleague Ahmed Al Sheikh from also uh, Heliot Watt University, so not that far from Kamal. Uh, I'll read a few lines about Ahmed, and then we will have the lecture, like always, and then uh, we will have question discussions again, like always. Ahmed is a professor at the Institute for Geoenergy Engineering at Heliot Watt University in Scotland. He joined Heliot Watt University in 2013 from the Auden Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at University of Texas in Austin. Ahmed holds a PhD in Computational Sciences and Civil Engineering from McMaster University in Canada. So he has been quite dynamic. I mean, from Canada to Texas and then coming to Edinburgh, he has not stayed that long in one place, which is, which is nice. Professor Al Sheikh Research Group uh, works at the interface of computational subsurface engineering and machine learning, with recent contributions on flow control using reinforcement learning, reduced order modeling using physics informed residual networks, and multi fidelity uncertainty quantification methods for CCS sites. It's our pleasure and honor to host you, Ahmed, this week. Thank you very much for graciously accepting our invitation. Uh, to the audience, please note Ahmed's lecture would last for about 30, 35 minutes. He may take a little bit longer than that, but that would be absolutely fine. Uh, we are going to learn new topic, and we are so grateful he accepted to give this lecture. So he deserves five more minutes, by the way. And after the lecture, please uh, do type the questions. Uh, Kamal will uh, chair the discussion session and he will uh, pick up your questions, ask Ahmed about this, and then he would uh, give his comments, feedback on the subject as well. Please do not wait until end of Ahmed's lecture to post your questions. Please, whenever you feel appropriate, do post them because your question will trigger other questions. And this is always the case in academia, at least, when one student asks a question, another person will ask. So don't wait until the end of the talk. Do post your question whenever you feel appropriate. Uh, without any uh, further ado, Ahmed, the stage is all yours. Thanks a lot once more. Thank you, Hadi, for the introduction. Uh, I think uh, I am kind of like, yes, I hopped between many universities. There is one more university which is missing from, uh, from the introduction, which is Imperial College for two years from 2010 till 2012. And uh, definitely, I think my undergraduate degree is from Al-Azhar University, and there's a couple of years of teaching there as well. So the beauty of research and universities, you can move around and explore the world and learn and meet amazing people. So it's um, thanks to the, to the organizer for this initiative, uh, which is uh, as came about with the, with the time of COVID, and I hope it uh, outlasts COVID and all the pandemics. Um, and thanks you for, for, for inviting me to this talk. So in my talk today is, is about geostatistical modeling. And uh, geostatistical modeling deals with spatial data and uh, how it is correlated, how patterns appear there. The applications is, 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 is very diverse for that work. The outline of my talk will start with the introduction and uh, setting the framework. What are we doing and why are we doing what we are doing? And then after that, I will talk about specific um, a machine learning algorithm, which we are fascinated with. And we, uh, we used it uh, multiple times now, which is called a generative adversarial network. And then in the um, third part, I will, uh, this is uh, the, the bulk of my talk. What's new here is, is utilization of a form of conditional uh, uh, adver generative adversarial network to, um, to solve uh, a very interesting problem, which is non-stationary field generation. And then I will conclude my talk. So um, first, spatial data is everywhere. 
from uh, from an image like the bedrock geology underground, which is uh, you know, which is under the British Islands, which is shown here. You can see colors representing uh, different uh, geological uh, material or or bedrocks, and uh, these colors are somehow uh, have a specific pattern. So there is boundaries moving from south to north and, and, and coherent uh, bodies of bedrock. Uh, with some definitely, uh, if you look around Scotland, where I, where I am now, um, you can f see some uh, stochasticity and noise. So we can see, or we, with the aim of this image, to show that um, there is correlation in data. So if we have two points close to each other spatially, then they are most likely to be from the same time of rock, unless we are at the interface where things change. The second feature of spatial data, whether it's on the surface or the subsurface, is the uncertainties. So here I borrow another image for a map of nitrogen in the top soil over Africa. And you could see from the top part this is a map of the uh, value itself of the nitro nitrogen total, where the low value will be dark. And over the Sahara, is there is no nitrogen because the soil there is sandy. Um, but then it increases until we reach the, uh, the middle of Africa here. The values are, are somehow um, uh, in the middle is a bit higher. And then it, it goes down again, and then it have a coherent structure. It have a pattern for that. But the aim of this image to say that this map in the top is not the complete picture. The map in the top have to be looked with the map in the bottom, where we show the uncertainty at each point. There is, the measurements are usually um, not taken everywhere. Some of these measurements are indirect using satellite images. Some of these measurements are land-based with high accuracy, and some of it land-based with low accuracy. So we need to augment special data with standard deviation at every point, or another map of the uncertainty in our measurements. So the second, the second kind of characteristics of special data, whether it's on top or below the surface, is the uncertainties. If we look to how people have been modeling geology, who are dealing with the statistics, they adopted the multi-realization approach. So instead of providing a map and a standard deviation, they adopted a different approach where they draw sample from the distribution behind the data. So if we assume that this is a square domain or rectangular domain under the subsurface, and we are interested in injecting CO2 to store it under the ground, and these are realization for the permeability, some regions we are sure of the value, and the common value at spatial location will be there. So if we look to one corner, the common value is there. And um, so, for example, here, common value of blue. Uh, and in other regions, there is different values. This is an indication of existence of uncertainties. So the two maps, which were for the nitrogen, uh, total nitrogen in the top soil, are kind of like a different representation for uncertainties than here. Here we adopt the multi-realization approach, which are equally probable realization of the same thing. So in summary, spatial data exists everywhere. It contains patterns. There is correlation in 2D, 3D, or in time. And if especially we are dealing with the subsurface, the data is highly uncertain. Similar techniques could be used for population dynamics, for epidemiology. So spatial data is everywhere. And we are interested in understanding these patterns, generate patterns, generate realization for further studies. Two more important concepts when we deal with the specially geostatistical data, spatial data, but it's in the subsurface, is relying on analogs. So a common approach here you can see in geology is that um, 
people could see something which is exposed, like an outcrop where the depth is exposed and try to think that this is similar to something we don't see under the ground. So one would start with an image like this and the geologists using extensive uh, knowledge in the domain could say that a specific field to store CO2 in will, um, will have uh, layering similar to this outcrop. So relying on these patterns allows us to generate 3D models out of T 2D views. So we need to do extrapolation somehow. And we need to generate multiple realization of these properties underground and later use it for physics. It's in based simulation to inject fluids um, and study the fate of contaminant, contaminants, for example, if we are modeling contaminant transport in the subsurface. We could also adopt things from satellite images to understand the subsurface. So here is an image of Prahamabutra River in Southeast Asia, which crosses multiple country. This is a braided river with very interesting details. And we can segment these images and extract a kind of like rectangular of this. So once it's segmented, it's, it's, it's a background versus river. And it's braided by meaning it has these small islands and these interesting patterns. We can take patches out of that and we use it for machine learning to learn these patterns. Uh, it's worth noting here that all of these patches have been realigned to, to so always the flow is coming from south to north. So now we are taking the analogy or the um, way similar to, to, to using to outcrop analogs. We are taking analogs from satellite images to try to uh, understand the subsurface. So somebody, uh, an expert in geology could come to somebody like me who is more um, computational background and says, here's a pattern which will appear in, in this domain, which you are studying or trying to understand the flow down there to inject CO2, uh, try to generate similar patterns or realization which respects these patterns. And this is where machine learning comes in. Machine learning allows us to do, to learn directly from observation. And this is not to say that standard approaches which does, which, which does not rely on machine learning are not good. We have gone as like um, so far advanced many, many fields using algorithmic approach where a smart person design an algorithm to generate patterns or to solve problems. What is the becoming way more popular nowadays is that we can access large data sets and we can learn directly from it without writing the algorithmic things. So it can be that, so the two routes could complement each other. Sometimes machine learning will be more appropriate. Some people postulate that the future is all machine learning. We, you could agree with that or not, but it have a, a use in the middle of the mix here uh, as a part of what I be, will be presenting today, we adopt a machine learning approach. This is not to say that algorithm exists and they perform somehow in a satisfactory manner uh, for many, many problems. But they have, as a machine learning, have some advantages and we will highlight these advantages. So an algorithm which is famously used in geostatistics to generate patterns, simplified patterns, is the SNSM algorithm. So as we talk about machine learning, we are trying to learn patterns from images. And this is a problem of learning without classification. So you could, the, 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 the simplest form of machine learning is a regression. You have an X axis and a Y axis and you want to fit a line. This is a machine learning model. But we need to have the Y values. Another class of machine learning algorithms is what's called clustering algorithms. Just plot your data and it is grouped into groups. Generative adversarial network is somehow similar to unsupervised learning, but it is more than that. So we don't need to, uh, to have a pair of XI and YI, and, um, and, and then we have a set of input and output to, to map that. We only have sets of XIs. 
but we are able as well to generate additional data using the patterns. And this is where the interesting um, design of these algorithms comes in. So now, the, oh, the, I think I have two uh, slides with mathematics. This was one of them. And the most important part I want to, to highlight is this part. And this equation here, I want to simplify it or give an example, which is uh, to, to, for, 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 for general audience. So let's assume that we are dealing with a population of male from uh, Scotland, and we can get the average height of a male is 175 centimeter with a specific standard deviation. Using the properties of the population, by meaning mean and standard deviation, we can randomly sample from that population heights. So the Y will be, this Y will be a sample out of the height. And the G is a function which allows me to sample from it. So I usually will draw a random number from zero mean and standard deviation, which is Z, and then, it's, then add the mean and scale it. And then I get a realization from, um, from the population. So I will probably get 180. I will get one sample every million times 190 or 195, or one sample which is very short. So this process is, is the process of generation of, of samples from a distribution. Usually we feed it what's called Z, which is a, a standard normal variable. If we want to generate images, so Y will be the image from the geological pattern, we have to, to obtain this complicated G function, which is a nonlinear complicated function, where we feed it some noise to generate realization from it. And then we should be able to judge if this Y is a valid sample or not. So this is, I hope, is, is the most simplified way to what is a generator. And as we are dealing with neural network, we abstract complex nonlinear functions like the G with um, a big convolutional neural network. And convolutional neural networks invented back in the 90s, were uh, popularized and used for computer vision applications. The common use for convolutional networks that we feed it an image and we get a class. So an image and we say it is one of the thousand, hundred classes here, dog, cat, plane, table. For generation, it is reversed. So we feed the noise we multiply the noise here in the first layer will be this X multiplied by a big weight matrix. We need to find that it have some properties of sparsity and shared weight weights over all over. So the number of free degrees of freedoms are small, but still it's a lot of weight and this is a bias vector. And then we apply simple nonlinearity function and we keep composition of that inside of that. So this is, is a passing of data from layer one to layer two. And we adjust the weights that at the end, we end up with an image which has three channels, RBG, or if it's a binary channel, it will be one. And of size 64 by 64, if we are generating images of 64 by 64 pixel. The question is, how do we find these big weights which controls the, the transformation of data from random noise to an image which we call geologically plausible image. This is a very hard problem and we don't solve it in a supervised way. We don't have a specific vector known for specific image to pair them together and, and use back propagation to learn that. What we know or a user can do is that we can say, let's randomly select weights, randomly select a, an input noise vector, generate an image. Does it look like a geology or not? Does, then we repeat the, 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 the question again and again. And one in, in a trillion, we will hit the jackpot by meaning there will be, um, there will be uh, a, we will select the weights uh, to, to, which are correct weights. And, and when we feed multiple realization for Z, we get the, uh, we get the images which are from the geology. 
we definitely we cannot do that we will replace the human judge by looking at the image and saying it is uh, geologically plausible or realization from the same distribution as the geological images to another neural network. And that neural network will be another big convolutional neural network where we feed it an image and through a system of linear transformations, which is multiplied by another weight matrix, big weight matrix with sparsity pattern with weight repetition, to, to, to be convolutional and specific bias vectors. We need to find the weights of that. We get at the end true or false. So we feed the geological image and we can get true or false by meaning, is it a good geological image or bad geological image? So this is another neural network. We need to find the weights for it. And GANs is the algorithm which is somehow um, can find the weights of the both networks together. And this is the invention of, uh, of Ian Goodfellow. Is a, the, the idea itself probably is, is older than that, but he, in 2014, really developed the algorithm to be um, usable and programmed it. So this is where um, the algorithm alternate between two steps. Step which we know, we have some training images, which is geologically plausible. We have initialized generator, which probably is generating images of noise. So this is what we start with. And we have initialized discriminator, which can tell, which is the aim of it to, to know, is it, are we, uh, is this an image noise, a no, noise image or geology, which as well is not trained. The first phase is to select some images which are from the geology, from my, my training data, fix the weight here, generate some noisy images, and train this discriminator a bit. And I call it train it a bit, and I will explain it why. So it will be paired, these samples will be paired with an index zero, and these samples will be paired with an index one. Good geology, nothing, noise. And we can train this um, discriminator or the teacher. Some people call this is teacher and this is student. Once we do that, we can go to the next step. We fix the teacher's weight and we try to adjust the weight of the generator such that the image is generated by the generator. Once passed through the teacher, the teacher says they are good. So what's called fool the teacher. By meaning, if the, and, and try to adjust the weight here until we really fool the, the, the teacher. And, uh, and so somehow this is where the, if the teacher is so good, you can't fool it. Because all of these images should get score of zero. So we will not going to be able to learn anything. This is like a teacher who says to the students, your homework is bad. Your homework is bad. No feedback, no way to improve. So the teacher should be initially lenient by meaning saying, okay, these images are not one, but they are 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So the generator can know 0 0.3 is better than 0 0.1. Let's move my weights in the direction of 0 0.3 instead of 0 0.1. So this is why we need to train the discriminator in the first step, only a few steps. Don't overtrain it. Don't make the teacher very strict. Make it loose. And we keep alternating between training the, 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 the discriminator and the teacher. In some sense, the teacher and the student grow their skills together. And finally, this is when we put everything together, and if we feed the, um, the, the, the training data set to be an art, expensive art, we hopefully we can, at the end of the, of the, of the training, we can obtain um, a good art, which can be sold for millions. And this is what, what's currently, uh, you could see in the news, people are using this to generate uh, art. Uh, this is definitely uh, to be humorous. This is Lisa Simpson. For those who are aware of the Simpson 
we are we are we don't aim to generate Lisa Simpson. We actually aim to generate images which are not cartoon, which are similar to the Mona Lisa. And we will show that when we feed geological images to uh, to this algorithm and do some effort in balancing the training together, because if you train at one step, if the teacher becomes so strict and produces only zeros for the for the student, the students cannot learn. So the learning collapse. If we manage this balance of min-max game, which is this is why non-cooperative game. Um, we can generate amazing things. We can generate things which are good. So um, definitely, uh, for those interested in the al original algorithm, the main reference is Ian Goodfellow's paper in 20 with Joshua Bingo. These are two very famous names in, in the field of, of machine learning. Joshua Bingo, I think, is a Facebook uh, NYU originally. And Ian Goodfellow, I, uh, I, think, he's, uh, I think he's now Tesla, uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, uh, and, and this is in 2014, you can find it in archive. The second paper, which is a uh, few years ago, we came across it and we, uh, we utilized it in some publication is was the sign GAN, which have an improved training properties. And this is when we come to early work on GANs for geostatistical modeling. Um, and in 2017, three publications came around the summer of 2017, one from Imperial College, Lucas Moser, uh, definitely Eric Laloy from Belgium, I think, uh, uh, at that time. And my PhD student, Sheng Sheng, at that time, uh, tried to adopt this algorithm and, and, and somehow explore it for the field of either poor scale modeling. Eric and, and us worked on, on, on geological model. Uh, whether it's single phase flow or two phase flow. At that time, uh, the, bo both Lucas and uh, Eric Laloy used uh, what's called vanilla uh, or standard GANs um, with, with convolutional network. Sheng used something called the Weierstein GAN to have a better training. And what I call better training, most machine learning algorithms, we expect that we have a loss function and along the training, the, the loss function goes down and the quality of the solution we obtain increases with more iteration. And if we look to these columns here, um, the quality of the images we generate are increasing along the training line. For standard GANs at that time, this is the early versions of GANs in 2017, were not very stable and the user needed to pick when to stop visually and judge this is good. So at that time, WGAN was high quality. Then if we uh, jump four or five years ahead, so many advances came, came from the computer science uh, community. The first one was spectral normalization. Um, let me stop here and say something about um, the difference in my opinion between machine learning and AI. The more we delegate to the learning and the less we design ourselves, we move toward AI. So if we define what go what's good and bad using a likelihood function, mean square error or any sort of error function, this will stay in supervised machine learning. Here we are delegating what's good and bad to a teacher, which is another neural network. So we can say that we are moving toward more AI because we are not designing a likelihood function. Corresponding to that move or relaxing the problem, we are learning a likelihood function along with what we are trying to achieve, which is a good generator. Um, we added more degrees of freedom to the problem. So we need to optimize a lot of weights. And if we don't constrain these weights in smart and intelligent weights, uh, intelligent ways, the uh, optimization algorithm fails. And anybody who deals with non-standard machine learning by meaning supervised learning, uh, this is non-standard. With GANs, we'll find that training is difficult and may collapse. If you deal with reinforcement learning, the same thing. You are collecting your observation and training a policy to, 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 to take actions. So you are doing two things. So you can somehow diverge. So you need to control the training. In Weierstein GAN, they somehow truncated the weights to constrain it around zero. 
there is more advanced techniques to do that by constraining the spectral norm of the weights. The second idea which was improved the training is to train the discriminator a little bit more and faster than the generator. You always need to have the teacher better than the student. You don't want the student to be able to fool the teacher and, and, and get good grades easily. They should be able getting to get feedback by meaning they should not get zero, zero, zero for all the, what they, they, they present. So the teacher should, should somehow say, no, 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 this is good, better than this. To, so the, the student should be able to learn better. And then uh, self-attention GAN is, is, is a, what's called self-attention module, which looks to a distant part of, of the image and account for that, the correlation between distant parts of the image in the decision. Uh, building on, uh, on self-attention GAN, uh, a group, I think, from Google, with I think the lead author was from Edinburgh University, developed a big GAN. It was a big thing and a very big model to train on TPUs uh, for, for, I think, this was, at that time, was was massive model. People were measuring the consumption in terms of, of years of electricity, like equivalent to home heating it for a year. And then I think um, style GAN came about from, from NVIDIA and they improved on it. So a lot of improvement have happened. Training GANs is way easier now than early on, and, but consumes a lot of computational power. Adaptations appeared. People were uh, like uh, publishing, like generating artificial data for geological model or semi-real data and trying to publish this uh, use of these algorithms to do the geology. Now, what is, uh, what is my group uh, was doing in, this, in that time? So um, uh, this is the two questions we are currently trying to address. And we think that we have obtained uh, solutions or good solution for that, uh, for these two questions. The first question is, can we train GANs using limited data? And there is a good reason for that. And the second question, can we generate non-stationary field? And I am assuming that non-stationary fields is not clear now. It will come about in few slides. They are intertwined. So if we solve the first, we can solve the second. And we might say that we tried the second, and then we, we, we simplified the problem to the first. Uh, research is nonlinear, but the presentation now is, is linear to be easy. So this is where conditional GANs comes in. Conditional GAN was developed again in computer science. We are on the receiving side of, 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 of the algorithmic development from computer science. They are moving way, way faster than anybody could imagine. Um, in computer science, they were trying to generate images of dogs and cats and, and horses and tables. And they discovered that if they feed the generators a type of the image they want, in addition to the noise vector, and similarly feed the discriminator the type of the image along with the image, they can somehow constrain the learning a bit and produce higher quality images of dogs, higher quality dog images of cats. In the geology, if we look to very idealized geometrical-like structures of, uh, of, of, of the channels in the background, we could say that the condition be the proportions. So 25% of the pixels are, are, are rivers, are channels, and 75% and are, the, are the background strata. And we can have the condition of 30% or 35%. This is what we call limited training data. We don't have samples for all possible um, proportion. So we collected a thousand sample for this, a thousand sample for this, and a thousand sample. And we asked ourselves, can we generate for the missing proportions? Or can we generate for extrapolated proportions? So point two. And if we can succeed in doing that reliably, train again to do that, we can move forward to one step forward, which is we do more amazing things. And we actually succeeded to do that, but with adaptation of the standard algorithms. 
the standard algorithm doesn't have a mix between cat and dog. There is some, nothing in between. Here we are using something which is continuous, proportion, it is continuous. So we needed to, to modify the conditional GANs a bit to do that. So the red boxes here are what we call seen samples. So, and these are artificial samples, by the way. These are, these are samples generated by our GANs for a fixed random vector, and we change the condition along this line. These will be what we call scene conditions, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35 scene conditions, but in between these are unseen. And we can see that GANs are way better than it was in 2017. Initially, when we tried to adopt a conditional GAN, these samples in between would come, when we input 0 0.6, we would get samples of 0 0.25. And when we input uh, 0.28, we get samples from 0.3. GANs was memorizing so much and learning a little. So all the trained samples could be good from 0.3 or good from 0.25 proportions or good from 0.35. We were not able to interpolate between. We successfully, uh, through a set of st tricks, managed to, 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 to train a GAN to be good interpolator. And when we try to assess this using standard deviation of the samples, so we set, we, we decided to generate a couple thousand samples where the condition is 0.25, and we got the mean of all the samples, we found that it is 0.25. Definitely there are small errors. 0.3, it is 0.3, 0.35 and 0.35. And these are what the seen conditions. The unseen conditions are in between, Obviously, their errors will be slightly larger. Why? Because interpolation is not, it, we cannot have a perfect interpolation. It is like a Bayesian regression or Gaussian process regression. The more you, um, you move from your training data, the errors get larger, the uncertainty gets larger. We utilize specific set of tricks um, which can be summarized in three um, in three points. Obviously, this needs to be um, gone through the real paper, which 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 is now uh, almost in final review for computers and geoscience, and we will post it in uh, on archive maybe next week. There is two flavor of GANs, conditional GANs. One is called conditional batch normalization, and the second one is auxiliary cl cl classifier uh, GANs. For those who are aware, we used conditional batch normalization. We started again by auxiliary classifier because it's easier conceptually, but we obtained better results with conditional batch normalization. We needed to sample the unseen conditions. So we needed wild training to generate samples, which is artificial samples at the unseen condition so the generator can improve these samples. We modified the standard conditional batch normalization by uh, constraining uh, two parameters. This is where we push the data at the intermediate layer to be centered around zero. This is what's batch normalization. And to have a standard deviation of one, because, because, because this is, 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 is a neural network, deep neural network suffers from what's called a distributional shift. The data through, when it evolves through the neural network, it shifts. But the nonlinearity functions, the standard nonlinearity functions like tan h function or relu functions are always split the data around zero. So we, this is the idea of batch normalization is to push it back. And conditional batch normalization assumes that the pushing back, the amount of pushback to the, will depend on the condition. And the standard deviation will depend on the condition as well. Here, we, um, we, we didn't make the, the standard deviation depending on the condition because our data, the condition didn't affect the standard deviation of the data. So this was a small modification. We further explored the extrapolation properties. So the training data was, was, was 0.25 proportion and 0.3 proportion. So we generated at 0.2 and 0.25. Again, good results but not good to be not too good to be true so if we push the extreme extrapolation we fail and we are happy to fail then because we know that that um, that machine learning special neural network are not very good extrapolator it's good interpolator but not very good extrapolator but then we consider this an amazing result and we asked ourselves 
okay, we have, can now do global condition, which is global proportion of 0.2. Can we tackle the hard problem, which is non-stationary data where we have spatial conditions? What is non-stationary data? If we overlay a grid of four by four and get the proportion here, it will be high of the proportion of the channel versus here, small proportion. When the properties, it changes along the spatial domain, then we have non-stationary data. Non-stationary data is, is to be contrasted with with this, the global properties are the same. If we take a if we take a patch here, hopefully over multiple samples will be the same. So this is what's called non-stationary data. Again, these are idealized geometrical-like data, but it have specific property. Moving from left to right, we have high proportion to low proportion. High proportion, low proportion, high proportion, low proportion. And this is the only pattern we had in our training data. We didn't have high in the middle and low in the boundaries. So now we have limited, limited training data. These were 2,000 samples. All of them have uh, almost four or five channels with these banks. And all of them have big and then too small. We did that augmentation, flip to be big, small and flip across this axis, which still will be. So if we flip uh, along this axis, it will this will move down and this will do that up. So the conditions will be still the same, big to small. And we trained the spatial conditional GAN with many other tricks on it, because the condition now is, is, is a map of four by four. And we tried to generate what we have seen by meaning in the training we have seen proportions. This is the conditional map, which we added to, to the input of the generator. Large values, small values. We end up generating images, different images, always thick channels to thin channels. And when we average these, we end up with a map, which is similar to the input condition. We also have seen big to small because we, 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 we kind of did a data augmentation. So we flipped along this X here. So we can have big to small and we end up with big to small in the generated data. So far, unsurprising. Why? Because we know that GANs can generate things which are similar to the training data. The surprising part is what about unseen patterns? Now, this is an interesting result. This is a very, uh, or I consider it because it's my field, very interesting result. Here's condition which is never seen in the training data. Big values in the middle, zero values in the boundaries, and I'm generating realization respecting the continuity of the channels. Somehow, the wiggly part of the channels respecting the banks and multiple realization with some uncertainties because the average here, so sometimes there is, there is two channels, sometimes they are getting together. I can play around high channels up here with big value for the, for the proportions, which was never seen in the training data. Versus I can do this line as well. All of these patterns are unseen. What have been seen is again, this is what have been seen. Big to small, when flipped, will be big on the right-hand side to small. None of these patterns were, were in the training data. Now we are doing real stuff, which is, could be thought of as extrapolation, but it is not truly extrapolation. And when we um, plot the correlation between the target proportions and the generated proportion for a region, which is, uh, for example, this region here, we only in the training have seen small proportions. So this is why it is blue. All of this red is extrapolation. So, and we get consistent results for that. We further 
the, so um, this is a, a burner. So let me stop here and see why do we care about unseen patterns? This is 16, four by four. Let's assume how much data I would need if I want to train again, which doesn't have a capacity to do interpolation and, and some extrapolation. I will need to generate for each block here combinatorially. This is 16. If you do unsigned int, this is you end up with 32,000 combinations between zero and one. So I need here, I needed only 2,000 samples of large to small. I will need at each condition at least a few samples, 100 samples, maybe. So 100 multiplied by 32,000. And now I assume that the conditions are binary. They are not, um, they, they should be float and I should bend them at least for 10 values. So the number of combinatorial conditions which is needed to cover all possible realizations are enormous. And I will never be able to find that even if I look to nature, even if I look to um, satellite images. Now we go away from, um, from the uh, idealized images, which is geometrical like, and let's deal now. We have an algorithm. We know how to train it. We know what's the tricks of training it. We know how to make it on the idealized cases. Let's use the masks extracted from Brahmaputra River in Southeast Asia after aligning the flow to be from the bottom to up. And we have some, uh, I think, a uh, few thousand of this, 6,000 uh, masks. And can we do um, uh, the same ideas on this real data set? So after training a different generator, initialized from random values, we successfully uh, managed to get the same conclusions. We can generate patterns which does not exist in the training data. So if we input the condition high on a diagonal value, we end up with pushing all realization to have this thick channel moving from, from this corner to that corner. And it produces uncertainty. It's not one, it's not replication of the condition as an image. It have, it respects the patterns which were existing in the braided river. We further, uh, the, the results are many, so we can stop at it many, many times. But we did something very interesting. During the training, we always had a condition which is four by four, but there is nothing to stop us from refining this condition at the time of usage. So we could even put conditions. This is an image of 64 by 64, so we can narrow this to be to be forcing the condition to... Um, to be, to be high percentage of proportion. So we force the river to exist somewhere here. Definitely we reduce the uncertainty when we do that, but we can actually use this conditional GAN to, to, to introduce maybe point conditions. If you assume that this is a subsurface field and we are injecting CO2 and then we dig the well and we know that this is a, um, a river point, then we can force all the realization to respect that. So uh, about two to three minutes, if you could. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so what, uh, what did we conclude? Conditional GANs are amazing, allows us to solve a non-stationary data generation problem. We had to do our homework. We needed to start with understanding one condition. Can we do interpolation? Can we do extrapolation? And then we can only, when we succeed in doing that, we are able to do spatial conditions and address the non-stationary data, um, data generation. We can we prove that we can generate patterns never seen in the training data. We have results to show strong correlation between the local conditions. We have additional results to show two-point correlations from one pixel to, 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 to 16 and so on. Our aim next is to scale to larger models. So instead of 100 by 100 pixels, we want to move to 1,000 by 1,000, hopefully more. And we aim definitely for three-dimensional fields later on where the combinatorial conditions will even grow larger. If we are dealing with four by four and then we add one more four, then this is 64 is a complexity of the training data needed to train vanilla uh, GANs is, is grows more. 
And now I would like definitely to conclude by thanking people and acknowledging funding. People, it's been a, a very interesting, uh, like, and, and rewarding uh, um, journey to, 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 to work with Xing Shang from, from his PhD, who is graduated in 2018, I hope so, I hope my memory is good, and he's now at Oxford Big Data Institute. He did the early work on GAN, so as your sign GAN. Now it's my pleasure to supervise Al Hassan, who is uh, who's just finished his second year PhD uh, at Harriet Watt and produced a work on conditional GAN, both the single condition and, and, and spatial conditions. Funding is important to do uh, expensive research. So funding for Xing um, we came from scholarship from Harriet Watt, so I acknowledge that. The funding of project of Al Hassan comes from Total Energy, so the funding and support is, is highly acknowledged. And thank you all. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for this extremely informative, comprehensive uh, uh, talk. Uh, we see already plenty of questions posted, so uh, we have little time left. And uh, so I'd like to, without any uh, further ado, I want to give uh, Kamal the floor so to ask all the questions we can and uh, benefit from your presence here with us. Kamal, please. Thank you, Hadi, and thank you, Ahmed, for this fantastic talk. You know, I, I like, I really enjoyed to give a history of GAN and then many different uh, examples. And because I don't have background in it, this, and then it really, I learned a lot of from this talk. So we got many questions. I've got some questions, but I'll skip it. Maybe you can ask in your office later on, maybe next week. So if we'll you ask, and I will ask to come on. So let's just first give. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> so let's start with the first question with the Yuhang. Uh, who I think you touched upon the on the questions for the for the answer. So he's thanking for the nice presentation, and uh, he's asking if the static reservoir geological field might be challenging to be meaningfully generated. So the dynamic reservoir performance uh, for CCS bloom locations uh, wouldn't be much more complex. Can you comment on how what applicable strategies would be recommended for dynamic reservoir property estimation? So dynamic properties are definitely much harder. And what comes to my mind is a recent paper by uh, Google uh, brain team for, uh, for, for casting of rain. It's called now casting. It's, uh, it's published last month in, in Nature, I think. They used a form of conditional GAN where um, they used two discriminator, one which works on the time and the second works on the space. Um, the training data they have is actually from Scotland, from the weather, the Met Office, so they have tons of data. So I would say it's way, way challenging, but the recipe is there, the building blocks is there. And if you go to that paper, you see that they are actually, even if it is a physical problem, they didn't modify the algorithm, the same group invented for video prediction two years earlier. So they would have video images and they try to predict the next image. So the, this is where, where physicists and computational scientists like myself would be kind of like upset a bit. We wanted to see some physics there to do that, but there was no physics there. They actually provided a very um, comprehensive validation against uh, data assimilation techniques, numerical weather forecasting, and they managed to... to, to uh, to throw tons of data at conditional GANs with few tricks. And this is where there is a mix of art and, and, and science here. It's called tricks to, to, to train the neural network. And hopefully it, 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 its cross-validation score is high and it works. Maybe if you run it with a different seed, it, it, it might not be as good. But there is few tricks to, to put it together. Um, so probably uh, these techniques can be extended to the harder problems of dynamic properties. Thank you, Ahmed. The next question is, is very interesting from Marjay Boon. Uh, she's uh, looking into the example you gave for Mona Lisa. So is supplementing the process by training uh, similar to showing a similar exam solution, let's say a model exam from last year to the students. And in that case, uh, what characteristics should the training have in order to make the impact as expected? So um, 
so it it is not true like um like uh supervised learning where you see the exam before we still like um so this uh, reminds me with 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 an approach used in um in, in reinforcement learning where you start by uh, you want to do control and you you somehow solve a complicated control problem you use human experience for example if you are you controlling an autonomous car you put a driver and you try to imitate the driver first and then from there you start learning by random play here we are actually we are not giving we are only giving examples of good we are only giving examples of good. We never give example of bad because everything else is bad. Uh, so, so this learning somehow, uh, some people try to fix Z and, and say there is a random Z corresponding to the picture of Mona Lisa, the, another random Z fix it for another good image but this approach died after multiple trials. So in some sense, it is not looking, it's just, we are looking to examples. This is from start to end. The algorithm only sees few examples. And if we are looking to this, this is a few examples which are good. And it learns from there, from start to end. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, the next question is from Leila. I'll come back to Johan's question, and he's got a couple of more questions later uh, during the discussion. So Leila Hashmi, uh, she uh, is thanking for the interesting talk. Uh, is it possible to train the procedure directly by geophysical monitoring data? For example, uh, connecting geophysical data to geostatistics, uh, statistics, sorry, uh, somehow directly and filtering or processing of geophysical data within the algorithm. So um, the possibilities are endless. I would, uh, mm -hmm. I would direct you to the work of Lucas Moser. So I referenced uh, Lucas from Imperial College here. I think he did some work on extension to seismic in simplified form. Seismic data is very hard. It contains a lot of high frequency data. The noise to signal ratio is very tricky to separate. Uh, we uh, like there is I have PhD students working on that and future hopefully you can apply some ideas from GANs but um, as, as an emerging algorithm we we limited ourselves to clean easy data but um, but but it is it is possible in the future we will see more and more and I think if you go check Locus uh, website on Google Scholar, you, you will find uh, his papers, uh, one or two papers on GANs and seismic. Yeah, thank you, Ahmad. Uh, there are a couple of questions on, I think, the quality of the, of the results. One is from Manji, Manji Zhao, Zhao, who's thanking for the interesting uh, presentation. Can you comment on how to measure the quality of gen generated data besides, uh, did you compare it? GAN with other CNN algorithms to verify the effectiveness? So, so there's two hidden questions here. First, how do we, 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 we quantify the data? So the standard approach in machine learning is what's called Frederick inception distance, where we collect, we have a pre-trained classifier neural network, which is VGG, which is trained on thousands of images or even millions of images. And when we pass patches of images through that, we get activations or, or intermediate results. We get the statistics of these intermediate values in the middle, and we hope that we respect these statistics. Uh, we tried to use that, but we discovered that uh, this Frederick inception distance is not capturing the geology because the geological image is different than the natural image processing. So we fell back to the simple metrics of uh, two points correlations, connectivity functions. So we did that. You can see that in the early work of all of these three papers and, 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 and in the draft. So this is one topic. Yes, we did our homework to the best of we can do, like in, in, in what's relevant to the geology. 
In, com in terms of comparison to CNN, convolutional neural network as a supervised learning algorithm will always be cheaper to train in a supervised way because the, the propagation of gradients is from A to Z. You pass through it. It is well, well, well constrained problem, not a convex optimization, still not convex optimization, but it is very well studied and stochastic gradient descent Adam optimizer will successfully train it. GANs will solve a set of bigger problems. So will do better in that sense. So one could say if we are just doing enhancing an image and, 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 and to be honest, enhancing an image could be related to conditional generation by meaning conditional generation is moving from from this to this could be used uh, using uh, an autoencoder. So we map this to this uh, from, for, from four by four to 64 by 64, but we will lack the stochasticity. So people could use a variational autoencoder to do that. And there is some work there. Based on our experience, GAN is, is able to outperform that much, that way, way higher quality. And uh, we are yet to see the, uh, the, the, the supervised learning approaches, even with some stochasticity like variational autoencoder to achieve higher quality image. So this is an alternative approach and faster to train. We, 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 there, is, there is no free lunch there. GANs to achieve higher results is harder to train and very slow. Some of the time is up. Please, can you take a moment to say, Max? Yes, there are many questions. Please go ahead. So, do you want to go ahead? Or, uh, yes, yes, please take. Uh, you can okay. take uh, uh, Olwine, for example, because we have not featured him. In Sorry, question. say it again. Oh, yes, so this is what I, my, my next question was, at least very related to the previous one. So, is the GAN based approach you know, better suited than conventional geostatistics approach, for, especially for generating non stationary uh, geological realizations? So um, this depends on the use. So if, if MPS, MPS is algorithms, there is commercial libraries or, 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 or already um, uh, existing uh, libraries which have been tested and evaluated over, over 10 years. We can't, we can't uh, understate this effort. This effort have resulted in very high quality results. So if we are about to generate only a realization of non-stationary fields, MPS probably will generate equally good, if not better results. But then if we talk about the use, if we are using to this realization to in an inverse problem, we have a parameterization which never existed in, um, in MPS. We have an input which is 16 parameters and then another input which is um, 128 parameters. All of them are conditioned uh, as, as normal variables, except this is, this is uniformly distributed. And you can apply on that and sample smoother if you are doing inverse problems, or you can, um, you can invert it with, uh, you can chain it to your simulator. If your simulator can produce a joint, you can, you can solve it with a gradient base because the neural network have, have a gradient. With MPS, you, you rarely will have the gradient of the algorithm. So, for example, this is this is the MPS. You cannot get the gradient of the algorithm. You need to recode it maybe in Python, torsion, and remove all of this. So, we hope that it will be part of the mix, and uh, I can predict it will take over at one time because uh, it learns directly from data, and it have favorable uh, properties in terms of parameterization, compression. Once we have a, we have spatial data, then it's amenable to compression. So this is an additional feature, and it is differentiable. At the end, the generator can be inverted. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, shall we go for another one last question? I think it's it's the time is up. Ahmed okay. also has yeah. lost, and we could run for another hour of discussion and ask him. <laughs> Please get in touch with Ahmed. Ask him questions by email. He tries to respond as much as he can. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Let me. <clears throat> Thank you all. Olvine is also confirming he's quite satisfied with your comprehensive response. And Thank you. <clears throat> if you let me, I'll uh, take the chance to introduce our next week speaker is uh, Professor Andrea uh, Niemeyer from Utrecht University. Andre will uh, give a talk about induced seismicity and fault friction, fault activation. 
a very physics uh, oriented, uh, not much machine learning AI oriented talk next week. Until uh, next week, uh, please stay happy, healthy, and tuned into the channel. We see you all again the same time next week, Thursday. Thanks a lot, Ahmed. We did learn a lot, and thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Come it's my pleasure. Bye, everyone.